And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the usability of blockchain apps and um, your transition from working at Facebook as a product designer and working in mobile gaming to where you are now working in a fintech atmosphere. Um, how we're going to talk about that stuff. And we're also going to talk about her design team and what her what her day-to-day -day work is. And then we're going to hand it over to you guys and let you guys ask some questions. We have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes maybe, but all the time in Sounds the world good. for you. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and start off with, um, with, with your experience of working at Facebook. How did that translate to your new job as a design director for, for Coinbase? Yeah, it's interesting. So I joined Facebook about five years ago. So it's actually at a very different scale than, than we are right now. Facebook was around 3,000 people when I joined, and it was around 20,000 when I left. So a huge amount of, amount of growth, but at a very different scale. Coinbase is right now just a little over 200 people, so much, much smaller. So in scale, actually, it's more similar to my experience at, uh, at PopCap Games, where you're building a lot of things quickly on very small teams, you're very agile. Um, but in comparison to Facebook, it's more like finding ways to hack around things, move quickly, and dealing with uh, large numbers and ramping up to getting uh, high amounts of, of, or just a lot of scale. That uh, it's been an, an exciting process. So, but Facebook has a lot of different smaller teams in different um, areas, different on different features of the products. Do you feel like it's similar in that sense, or is it just? Um, yeah, Facebook actually, like the probably the max size of any product team was maybe around 30 engineers. So they, they did a good job of breaking things down into smaller and smaller pieces. So each team was still able to move fairly quickly, agile, and make their own decisions. Each team, like events or photos, sort of became like they were their own um, kind of startup or their owners of their own product, both in metrics and actually like development cycles and roadmaps and all of that stuff. So in terms of scale, it can be a little bit similar because right now, like if we're working on like say like the Coinbase uh, retail like main consumer app, we've got about maybe a dozen engineers working on it. Mm -hmm. um, full time, very hard working on it. Um, but yeah, not really in like the crazy amount that some people might think that, that we have. And what, do you, what are your day-to-day -day responsibilities at Coinbase? So you work, you work on Coinbase, you also work on GDAX, anything else? Or Yeah, it's actually, yeah. not everybody knows that yeah. Coinbase and GDAX are actually the same company. Um, we have, it was intentionally set up a little bit differently because GDAX is meant to be sort of the institutional clients and they're very different from the typical consumer who wants to just invest in a little bit of Bitcoin and see what happens. Um, we had... Uh, What's your question again? Let me just clarify what I want to answer. It's more like, how is the team broken down? Well, I, I was wondering more of, of your responsibilities. Mm. Like, what is it that you're designing gotcha, daily gotcha. Or, or that you're responsible for? The actual visuals, the UX? Right, um, right, right. So... Yeah. Um, as, as a design director, it's, it's all, of the, all of the products, as well as like the communication, the brand, and all the new initiatives that we're actually trying to build. So I try to stay away as much as I can from like all of the day-to-day -day -day design decisions. We have a team of four very talented designers who are in charge of and responsible for their own products. And I try to enable them to move forward. And I actually focus on overall Coinbase and sort of like crypto communication strategy, as well as like building the team and getting more people on board. Nice. And what what does your team consist of? So uh, four, four amazingly talented designers. And we recently, around, around the time that I joined Coinbase, which is around uh, five months ago now, uh, we moved from a typical like small company um, agency style where a designer would work on one product for like two months or three months at a time and then move on to actually embedding the designers on their own product vertical. So a designer became dedicated to GDAX where they could focus on that. There's a lot of context to be, to be had there. And it's not always easy to ramp people up all the time or constantly switch that. So having people be able to dedicate uh, to your specific team, get used to that process, and be responsible for the success of that has been a pretty awesome move. Yeah. Okay. And I'm like, I want to ask the audience questions, but I also want to keep things in the flow. So we'll continue with the Q&A, and then we'll, we'll open it up to our lovely friends out there. Hello. Um, okay. So thinking about something like a crypto market, you know, Coinbase is I would call it like the hottest company, hottest startup right now. Um, I don't know if you guys agree or not, but yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so something as permanent as sending and, like, okay, for example, 
Well, I was telling you guys earlier about that, the person who sent the ether to the wrong address. As a designer, we can blame ourselves for that, right? Because we have to add in an additional step to prevent that error. It's kind of like that situation that happened with the Hawaii alert. Who, you know, who gets fired? The, the person who pressed the button? Or should it be the software engineer and the designer? They should be not fired, but they should be educated. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that they're just, it's just like really close-minded, silly to be like, okay, so it's your fault when it's, when it's a UI error. Um, now, how do you manage that kind of, I don't I know, I just went on like teaching lecture there, but um, in terms, how do you prevent the users from making errors and, and guiding them to the right steps? We try to provide as much education and context as possible. We don't always do the right thing or don't always know exactly at what point they'll be confused. Um, but in the, in the point of like sending some, something to the wrong address, it's actually not very commonly known that you can't send Ethereum to a Bitcoin address because if you do, it actually just gets lost. It's not like it doesn't even work, it just is, is poof, vanished. So we actually um, you know, will look at things like support requests or like incidents where this has happened to people and we actually built in a little fail safe uh, before we show you a QR code or the actual address to where we send, where you can send um, Ethereum Bitcoin to, we tell you to please, please make sure you're sending Bitcoin only to the Bitcoin address or Ethereum only to the Ethereum address. Um, beyond that, there's probably still more that we can do, but we try to take like some steps so at least it improves something for some percentage of users and then uh, move on from there. Yeah. But that's, those are very real problems and we actually try to take it very, very seriously and are always talking to, uh, talking to customers. I wonder if this is just a, an idea, like, you know, like MasterCards or Visas, they have a certain number in the beginning and it automatically detects it as a Visa or as a MasterCard. I wonder if they could add like a ETH in the beginning, a crypto code, and then, yeah, it's just an idea. Somebody create it, right? Um, okay. Um, so we just talked about, about um, all right, and also we, uh, in terms of like alerts, uh, alerting your user error messages, it's like important to make them feel comfortable, like like it's not their fault, like you're guiding them. Make, how do you how do you phrase things so you make them feel comfortable? Well, that's a that's a good question, and I'm not I'm not a copywriter or content strategist, um, but we try to stay as neutral as possible, both to the side where we're not an advisory, we're not trying to tell you what to do or what you should do, um, but we try to, we have a principle of presenting the user with as much information as possible, so you can at least be empowered to make your own decisions. So we try to say, this is something that's about to happen. If you want to learn more, click this link and it'll take you to some support page that has a huge amount of information on anything anyone has ever wanted to know about that topic, but we really try to like segment out information into like the bare bones minimum, into what's more in depth, so it's always available for those who are interested to, uh, to actually learn about it. And, okay, so this is something that uh, I think for the next event we want to have it on, on usability, of, usability of exchanges and wallets and making sure, and Coinbase is notoriously like easy to use, simple, and so is GDAX. They're like known to be the best. So what are some of your tips that yeah, nice job. Um, what are some tips that you have to simplifying the user experience for an exchange or a wallet? Well, that's a great, very broad question. Um, one of the principles I try to keep in mind is to somehow bring it back to something that they can understand or some kind of parallel into like the current world or the current financial world um, where we can like create an analogy or um, find some simpler and simpler way to explain it. I try to like really test myself with this a lot by trying to, con to not convince, but to tell new people about Bitcoin and blockchain and what that actually means. So we're always trying to create the common building blocks and we're, we have a lot of internal debates about uh, certain things, uh, I'll, use, I'll use the SegWit 2x fork as an example. This fork was, was happening, then it wasn't happening, but we had a lot of internal discussions about how much information do we want to convey to a, to a typical consumer about what, what this is. So it really is a lot of like, maybe this amount of information is enough to understand. Like, well, how do you explain what a fork is? Well, it's like, if you, do you know what a branch of a software is? Okay, well, it's, it's like that. If you don't know what a branch of a software is, then we go somewhere even, even more simple to, uh, to find like some kind of common metaphor and understanding for what this concept is. But it's, uh, it's one of the biggest challenges that we face. Because you actually explained to me, I was like, why do I have Bitcoin 
cash. I didn't buy any. And I really, you're like, oh, it was a fork. I'm like, oh, okay, that's awesome. But um, maybe you can explain um, how that works, how the Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash, how, how the fork works. For, for those of you... I imagine a lot of you here know what a fork is and can explain it in a way that's much better than, than I can. But um, digital currency, it's a software. The same way you can make a fork off of a software, meaning you can make a copy of it and make some changes. And it kind of is like if, soft, if that one program is a tree, you make a branch off of it, which is why where the branch term comes from. And uh, when people took the Bitcoin software and some people decide they want to make some changes to it, um, they take a branch or make a copy of that software and that becomes another... Uh, another currency, in, that, in which case, or in this case, it was Bitcoin Cash. So if you had, say, one Bitcoin during the time that somebody made a Bitcoin Cash fork, you got to keep your one Bitcoin, and you also got an additional free Bitcoin Cash, because they just took a copy of that software and replicated it. And then from that point in time, all that, uh, whatever cash you had, or Bitcoin you had, sort of like did its own thing based on like the value and exchange of the, uh, of, of, of the market and the, and the price. But. Kind of sounds like, that clear? like similar to the token system, how the, the software is being built off of, um, I think I'm getting too technical here for myself, but yeah, <laughs> no, you, you know, like the software is like, like, for example, WeTrust is built on Ethereum and you're making, you still have Ethereum, right? And it's, but you have a token. But it's, I don't know, maybe, is that sound right? I think Ethereum is no? a little yeah. different because it's yeah. a platform yeah. for different tokens. So mm -hmm. like... Bitcoin came about and you can, and it had its own, its own blockchain, but Ethereum came about and said, you don't have to make a blockchain anymore, you can use our blockchain. And so a bunch of tokens came up um, using their blockchain, because now you can make a new token in about five minutes, that's what people say, um, using wow. the Ethereum platform, which is pretty crazy. I, I see speaker coin right here. Anyway, um, okay. And I'm just gonna ask, maybe one or two more questions, and then I want to open it up to the audience because we have so many smart people here tonight, and we want to hear what you guys are thinking. So um, what are, in order to, okay, so say that I'm a designer, maybe a mid-level designer, two to four years, um, and I work just, just basic UX stuff, but I want to, I'm interested in working in a blockchain or a crypto type of company. What are some skills that I should learn? It's, it's a great, it's a good question. Um, I actually think the skills, uh, sort of to Tanisha's points earlier, they're not necessarily different from what you have to do for a typical design process or designing consumer products, especially um, like crypto as an in industry overall, there's a lot of incredibly smart people uh, building all sorts of new technologies, protocols, ideas. I think the place that you can have the most impact is actually being the bridge between what they're building there and those complex concepts into the typical consumer and into communicating what the simplest building blocks are. So I actually think just be a good designer. Try to look at problems of uh, and anything, whether it's like cars or whether it's some sharing economy or whatever it is, there's a lot of similar design problems. Um, what you have to do is be able to take that thing and be able to know how to communicate that to people. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the uh, trickiest part. It's like a really good response, actually. So Thank take you. anything and learn, understand it, digest it, and then be able to communicate it simply. Right, okay. All right, so now I would like to pass the mic to you, all of you, on the count of three. Okay, no, um, okay, hold on a second. We have, do we have a volunteer here? Lucas, can you help us with the mic? Okay. There we go. Hi. Hold it down. If you shout, we can always just repeat the question as well. Yeah. Check, check. Oh. Okay, so my question is, can you give us a specific example of how do you guys do the UX research and how do you apply the results on the product? Thanks. That's a great question. Uh, we actually need to do far more user research than we can. If there's any user researchers in the audience, talk to me afterwards. Would love to make a connection. Um, honestly, we, we sort of work the same way as any like startup who doesn't yet have a user research team actually works. 
meaning we talk to our friends and our friends of friends, convince them to come into their, our office and ask them a bunch of questions. Um, sounds, pretty, sounds pretty basic, but that's uh, literally what we did for a lot of our uh, mobile app redesign, which came out around uh, last, last November. We would just find people, whatever was available, get some initial feedback, and that's still like not, not the best, it's not the most neutral, but it's still like you know, five times better than nothing. So that's how, that's how we do it. And we also start to send out a little bit of some consumer surveys, but we're really trying to build up that practice and to make it, uh, we recognize that's the, biggest, that's the biggest problem, the biggest hurdle to come across. You're giving Lucas a workout right there. <laughs> okay. Hi. So um, Fast Company just put out a updated 10 principles of design, you know, based on um, Dieter Rahm's 10 principles of good design. One of the principles is good design considers broad consequences. And one broad consequence I've read about for mining Bitcoin is uh, impact to the environment because of the processing power. So what is being done about that, if, if that is the case? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give a shot at answering this. I, I will say, yeah, I'm, I'm not um, an expert on the technical side. Um, but I think the answers that I've heard uh, people give in, in response to this is that there are a lot of direct computing costs to this, uh, or energy costs to, to cryptocurrency. But if you look at banking system, traditional currency, or any other system that we are fully using within the world, it's hard to quantify those exact costs to the environment, how much it costs. Like move one currency to another in terms of, or whichever. So because one thing, now digital money, it's all accessible, it's open, it's easy to quantify. Compare that against these existing systems that completely aren't. Um, it's not necessarily a fair, uh, a fair comparison. It was funny, it was Harry Ward, is he here? Where did he leave? Anyway, I met, I met this random guy who's, who came here tonight. Um, at, we, at, <laughs> and he, he, or, anyway, I was at a co-working space two days ago and he had mentioned that, that he thinks that there's gonna be a giant warehouse and they're gonna be regulated by the government instead of having a bunch of little miners. Like you have to have like one space and they'll be, um, and that's, that's what he predicted for the future. I thought that was interesting. But we'll turn it over to the next, next question. Right over, can we, oh wait, sorry, buddy. Here. Um, yeah. I wanted to know, um, when you're doing hiring, when you're looking at resumes, portfolios, how important to you, is it for a designer to have blockchain, crypto, DAP, decentralization experience? Oh my God, I, I, it's like I asked you to ask me that question. It's amazing. Um, this is actually a, another, a, big, a big misconception that for people entering the space that you have to have a lot of crypto experience or, or experience in, in blockchain. Uh, totally not the case. As I mentioned earlier, the biggest problems that I see in the experience is not about understanding the technology, but it's that communication to be able to explain this complex and completely new way of uh, what, you know, what dealing with currency and money and what that is and being able to talk to the typical person about it. So really we're looking for people who are interested in a challenge and who want to actually uh, tackle this kind of new industry and explain this new world and kind of bring everyone else along with it. But it is certainly not a, uh, not a requirement. I actually didn't know much about crypto um, until April of last year. That's when I bought my first Ethereum. It's an exciting, I bought five ETH. Such a good time. <laughs> and, um, and I started getting more into it. Um, as around like June, like June and July of last year. So it's, and, and that it just was a fascinating problem, a great space to dive into. So absolutely not required to know that much about the space. It's an intimidating place. Even, even the name itself, crypto, it's kind of an intimidating name. You know, we can try and shift things, say like, it's digital money, but uh, crypto is a, uh, it's short and catchy to say, but yeah. Tales from the crypto. Uh, uh, ah. Your next podcast. The next, um, hold on, wait, one, one. Wait, I had a question to follow up on that, which is um, fine, fine tech, fintech, fintech. Um, it's funny because I also got into investing over when I was hanging out with Nisa in July. <laughs> and then I started becoming fascinated with like how money works and how to save and how to like grow your money and all this. It leads to this whole other world. 
But do you think that people who come from a, a like a fintech background or economics background, or is there, do they have a better chance of success in this space? Is there any way that they could do research in that area to grow their skills? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. definitely helpful. Oh. I would never say it's it's not helpful, but I'd say it depends on what things you want to do. Like for instance, if you look at GDAX or some of our various um, institutional products, that's much more traditional finance oriented. So people who have that kind of background or um, you know, can talk about unit pricing, whatever that means. It's like, uh, that's, that's much more helpful in, in that particular segment. Whereas like, like Coinbase, the product is really trying to communicate to people and go for like the easy level of understanding and easy access to sort of the space at, at all. Yeah, okay. And we have time for two more questions. Hiding over here behind the he's pillar. Been, he's been waiting, yeah. Uh, my friend. question is just, uh, it sounds like one of your main responsibilities currently is kind of growing your team as Coinbase expands. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, your intention and consciousness around the culture of your design squad as you grow it and how that changes over time. Oh, another great question, thank you. Um, yeah, actually the, um, as I mentioned, we are f I have four designers, five including five including me. And when I when I started, there were uh, two two and a half uh, two designers here and one in um, one in um, Australia. And the two designers here both started um, earlier this year or last year now, 2017. So it's actually a very very new design team. So we're constantly trying to create the culture and create the process as we um, as, as we go along. And we try to take existing design processes, which we're all familiar with from our various backgrounds, but uh, very intentionally cultivate a way that works with the industry, meaning we have to work fast, we have to be flexible, we have to be reactive in some ways, and we have to be able to iterate um, fairly clearly. So, but we also, like, even though everybody, as I mentioned earlier, is on their own product verticals, we still have multiple conversations and uh, you know, common critiques and everything where we try to individually um, talk to each other and be able to uh, keep up and comment on each other's works and products and uh, be more unified in the space. That's a very important point. Okay, and I have a question for you. What are some common misconceptions about cryptocurrencies and about blockchain? Oh, this is a fun question. Mm -hmm. um, the most common one I hear is actually like a, ver a very simple one, but almost everybody I've talked to in the beginning thinks you can only buy a whole Bitcoin. That's, that's just, it's, it's funny here, but that's, that's com like, honestly, like almost everybody who I talk to for the first time about it, they're like, oh, I can't buy Bitcoin because that's too much and I don't have that amount. But, well, as we, as we all know, you can buy fractions of all of these currencies. So I'd say that even that like main, main point prevents so many people from even trying it. So that, that's a huge one. And the rest of it is, um, it's interesting because a lot of it is also misconceptions that sort of people might have about the traditional financial industry overall. Like you can look at, uh, there's, there's lots of, there's, there's numbers and the most common number people see is the price, but then there's also the market cap and then there's a bunch of other um, items that actually have impact on how much you might think something will go up, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of misconceptions around there. And I don't know if I could ask you this question or not, but what are your favorite coins? I, <laughs> the ones offered on Coinbase. Yeah, okay. Is that, is that it? That's it. That's it? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, you guys, we have to move on, but we, well, Wait, didn't you ask a question? Before? Oh, wait, no, we have, to give him a, we have to give him a question. But we need more ladies to ask questions. We have to diversify here. No? Okay, come on up. I'm like, no. Hey, so I'm wondering, um, what, what are the biggest pain points your users are currently facing, uh, and how do you solve those problems? Um, and two, Separate question, but do you guys have a design system? Uh, cool. Question one, uh, biggest pain points. Uh, honestly, if we look at our support tickets, which is a pretty accurate way of gauging what, what people are stuck with, uh, it's signups and onboarding. It turns out identity verification and fraud prevention are incredibly hard problems. So... And, <laughs> um, getting people to take a driver's license photo correctly and to have it show up in and, and our systems and be recognized, huge, huge problems. There's also like a lot of um, not clearly communicated problems, like the address that you sign up with or the name that you sign up with has to match the name on your credit card or bank account. And a lot of these are not as well communicated. So what we do is we try to um, 
I mean, these are very like simple tactical ways. We try to literally with words tell people that this is what they need to do. And we also try to show by example, like actually like, here's how you take a, here's how you take a photo, here's how you actually show us who you are and verify your identity. But it's, a, it's definitely a long, it's a, it's a long slog and it's a, it's a tricky process. And your second question was design systems. Oh, that's good, yeah. What is, uh, what is your definition of a design system? Oh, I, you want me to do it? It's not, it's it's not meant to be rhetorical. Yeah. I was just <laughs> curious how you're defining yeah. it. So definition of a design system being roughly like a style guide to uh, steer the visual design of the rest of your products. We have a very rough and loose design system in place, but with the rate and the pace that the industry changes and we're trying to build new products, uh, loosely we make things clean, clear, and maybe blue. And we try to go, go through with that. We try to be consistent with fonts, but we do our best. You know, We try to solve what we think are the most important problems and really have to prioritize our, our time. It's a small design team. Gina Bolton from, she did Clarity Conference. Um, she is brilliant with design systems and um, she did all of the, well, she led the Salesforce uh, Lightning design system team. Um, but, but yeah, Connie, you're doing an awesome job um, and everybody should look, you know, you look at Coinbase and GDAX and, wait, I did have one more question, which is that what, do you have any other um, exchanges that are doing are usable and are, do, could you name any? Because I actually really, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have accounts on probably all of the other exchanges. I think it's just kind of like a good, good practice to see what else is out there. Um, I'd say most recently, uh, based on availability of signups and other things, um, I, the least last one I tried, which I enjoyed, was, was Binance. Yeah. It took a while for me to get verified on it, but, but yeah, it works. Okay, so thank you, Connie. Thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. If you have awesome. more questions, feel free to find me afterwards.